I'm Justin Barrett, president of Blueprint 1543. And I am Ana Avila. Welcome to this Integrated Life, a podcast for those who seek to engage with life's biggest questions using the tools of the sciences with theology. Justin, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Our first episode. Are you excited? I am very excited. Thanks for uh, doing this to me. I mean, with me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We're going to have so much fun just talking about all things integration. That's what our first episode is about, actually. Oh, integration. Okay. What is it? Why are we calling this podcast This Integrated Life? Um, what's all? What's it all about? And I wanted to start our conversation with a book I was reading this week. And that could be a great conversation started for us. Okay. It was John's Polkinghorns. Pol Pol You're going to correct my pronunciation. You know that. That's so you can do that. John's Polkinghorns, Pol Science and Religion in the Quest of Truth. I think that's what the book is called. Okay. And he, on his first chapter, I'm going to show it here so we can read it together. He is explaining... Um, the four ways science and theology or religion have been um, made to interact or not interact, I guess. Um, and he explains this four, this four ways these two disciplines can interact or not. The first one is conflict. And here he says, conflict corresponds to the situation in which one or the other, science and religion, asserts the claim to be the only source of worthwhile truth and understanding. Okay. Uh, that's the first option for us, apparently. What do you think about that? Um, well, yeah, that is one of the options. Um, it's not a, much of a starter, I think, uh, as far as a good option. So this kind of activity and what Polkinghorn is doing here, uh, some would call theoretical integration. And that's when we zoom out uh -huh. and we think about how uh, do these big conceptual spaces like science, religion, whatever those things are, how do they map onto each other theoretically on a big, broad yes. level? And you're right, the first one that is often talked about as conflict because at least some segments of society have tried to encourage us to think, oh, well, uh, this big thing that we call religion and this big thing we call science really don't have anything to do with each other. In fact, they run into each other. They, uh, they're they incommensurate with each other. Um, uh, I think that's just wrongheaded in a couple of, couple of ways. One is that it's pretending that there's this thing out there called science to begin with. Hmm. Um, that's, it, it's heuristically helpful. It's okay to sort of, you know, in an informal way to talk about, but when we start getting serious about intellectually mapping a space, science onto this space, religion, we better know what we mean by those two things. And this whole idea about science being a thing that you can draw a nice clear boundary around is actually, a, well, it's not just a contested idea. Most people who think carefully about this from a philosophy of science perspective say it's just not true. Hmm. And that might surprise us. I mean, most of us, because we've kind of been told, oh yeah, you go to science class when you're in school and in science class, you learn science and you don't learn history and you don't learn I don't know, writing, and you don't learn math, you learn science. But that's that's fine for grade school, but we're not in grade school <laughs> anymore, <laughs> right? Um, so when we think about well, what is this thing, science, we're using it as shorthand for the kind of intellectual pursuits that developed about 500 years ago in Europe um, in a particular kind of intellectual space, a particular kind of historical space, by which we make discoveries about the natural world around us. Well, it turns out that system of knowing, if we look at it very carefully, it actually has baked in theological assumptions or philosophical assumptions already to get going. And so I'm bringing that up because what are those assumptions? You might say things like, well, there's a knowable world out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a real world out there and you can know something about it. How? By sitting in your armchair and reflecting on it? No. I mean, that's 
some some philosophers thought that's the way to do it, but others would say, no, you got, actually have to go out and look at it. Well, why do you have to look at it? Why can't I just sort of think my way to it? Well, because it turns out it's what philosophers would call contingent. It could have been otherwise. Um, well, those are assumptions already about that natural world and what we need to do that underwrite this acti these activities that we call scientific ways of knowing, but they're based in a certain philosophy or even a theology. Uh, what do I, you know, the theology, like, no, God made the world. That's why it's regular. That's why it's knowable and predictable because a predictable God brought order out of chaos. Hmm. And he made these creatures, us, in his image to a certain extent, which means, at least in part, we've got the conceptual tools to know something about that order, that divine order that he's put on in the created world. And so we can go and look at it. Okay, well, if that's how I'm approaching what it means to do science, I've got these assumptions from somewhere else that are sort of pre-scientific, then I can't draw this boundary around science and say, those theological things can't intrude. Yeah. Or, or that there's a necessary some people, conflict. Some people think that maybe science is like the more evolved way to think about the world. Maybe, yeah, we needed this religious theological thought when we didn't understand how to study the world. But now that we understand how we can better understand the phenomena, we don't need that kind of thinking maybe. Yeah, I think you're right. I think a lot of people do think that's it. That Oh no, we've seen this nice steady progress in sort of how to make sense of the world around us. Lo and behold, you know, 500 years ago, it may have been built on sort of theological understandings, but we don't need those anymore. Um, we've moved past that. I think you're right. People think that way. They think What's wrongly that way, it seems to me. Way? Well, it's sawing what? off the branch you're standing on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? So anytime I go and look at the world anew, I still have to have confidence that, for instance, that the kind of order that I'm trying to discover is knowable. Well, how do, why do I think that? Well, science tells us that, does it? No, we assume mm -hmm. that as scientists. Yeah. And in fact, science hasn't given us strong reason to think that independent of those other kinds of assumptions. Um, because it turns out we could have all kinds of wrong ideas and still be here doing fine. Thank you very much. And in fact, that's kind of the point of the sciences is that <laughs> we have lots of wrong ideas and we're constantly getting new, hopefully better ideas. But notice that that even that idea of progress in science, that, oh, what we used to think is true isn't anymore, assumes that we can trust to, at least to a certain extent, our cognitive faculties to give us true beliefs of some sort, or at least better beliefs. But why think that? We're providing evidence that we've been getting things wrong all the time. Well, maybe we got the foundations of science wrong. Maybe we're still getting the sciences, the foundations of science wrong. We need resources, intellectual resources outside of the sciences in order to get the sciences going. And so just saying, ah, we don't need that anymore. It mm. really is just cutting off the branch that you're standing on. So there's that. But also the kinds of ways of knowing that we had pre-sciences, pre, you know, 500 years ago. Well, they're still here. I still don't use the sciences to figure out what I had for breakfast. I use my memory. Mm -hmm. I still don't use the sciences to determine that right now we're having a conversation. I use yeah. my perceptual abilities and just my sort of ordinary reasoning faculties. And for most of life, that's what we need. That's what gives us true or at least good enough reliable beliefs. The sciences build on those. They don't push those away and say, ah, we don't need that anymore. No, every time I go into a lab, every time I interact with human subjects, and every time I make observations, I'm still using the basic stuff too. I've just added new tools for knowing, new epistemological tools on top of those. So they haven't displaced them. They've just been added to them, which is why I think we should be excited about the sciences. They give us new tools that are really awesome in some domains, but it doesn't mean we don't need the old tools. It's, I, that's just wrongheaded. Great. So that takes us to the next way we can relate science and religion, I guess. Some people um, admit, yes, we cannot dispense with uh, religious thought, theological insight, but there's this independence view where 
science you have it over there and religion all the way over here and they don't talk to each other they just each of them do their own thing yeah and some people would even go specify that a little bit more the reason they don't do their own thing is well science is about describing the way things are yeah. and maybe religion is about telling us what we should do or ought to do or moral mm -hmm. judgments or the values we should have and so sometimes there is that assumption that we can, well, yeah, we can have both, but they need to be kept apart from each other. We need a mm -hmm. hard wall because one is about what ought to be and one is about what is. Um, yeah, that distinction falls apart too. If we start inspecting <laughs> it pretty closely, uh, it sounds pretty good. And in a lot of domains of life, it kind of makes sense. So I, I totally get why some people are really attracted to this idea because you might think, well, what the scientist is doing, uh, let's say the astronomer who is studying distant stars or galaxies and looking through their telescope and going, oh, wow, man, there's this spiral galaxy over there in this location. It really has no bearing on the rest of my life. Uh, and so it's separate. And so it looks separate. And so... Yeah, why monkey with that? And you might think going the other way around, you know, the claim that, uh, you know, Jesus was God in the flesh and came to save us from our sins. Well, that doesn't change what I'm seeing through the telescope. So it really feels like, okay, there's there's a difference here. So I, I see why one could be attracted to this independence kind of position because functionally, it works pretty well most of the time. But from my sort of previous comments already, it's not a perfect, it doesn't perfectly extract. There's still a touch point between mm -hmm. certain kinds of religious or theological views and our scientific ones. And I mentioned some of those. Those are things like there's a knowable permanent world out there, a real world that's knowable. Uh, the past is like the the present, the present is like the future. And that's why we can make observations now and apply them to the past, or we can make projections about the future because we don't assume that the world and all of its sort of underlying structure is in constant flux in a random and arbitrary kind of way and so forth and so on. There are those underpinning assumptions that make doing science possible. So that's at least one touch point between science and the sort of religious or theological thought, but there are others. And I think the most important ones have to do with those of us who do scientific work. What gets us out of bed in the morning? What mm. what what gets us doing the work of, of 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 the sciences at all? How do we pick the topics that matter to us? Well, science is value free. No, it isn't. Mm. There's no scientist who has no values, and it's scientists who do science. So science can't be value-free because the people doing it aren't value-free. They're deciding what questions are worth studying. Our governments are deciding which questions are worth throwing money at. Our mm. foundations are deciding which money questions are worth throwing money at. So people are making valued decisions about how to do science and what science should be done. And then we're making these valued decisions about things like how should we interact with our uh, the subjects of our work. So if we're in the human sciences like I am, well, how am I treating my human subjects? That's not a scientific question. That's a moral question. Well, where do those moral values come from? Well, for those of us who are religious, from our religious tradition, hopefully. Uh, what about animal subjects and animal research? Well, that would apply there too. Um, and then there's, of course, research that's not quite as direct, but it might be looking at cells. Anytime you're bringing living things in, suddenly there are these moral and ethical kinds of dimensions. And then what? how do I interpret the findings? How do I market those to the general public? What are my responsibilities to the broader humanity in terms of delivering my scientific discoveries? Do I share them? Do I hide them? Do I spin them in a certain kind of way? those are decisions too that have to do with our values. Well, where are those values coming from? Again, they're not science values. They are pre-scientific values. They're coming from somewhere else. They're coming from our worldviews. And 
if it's a religious worldview, they're coming from those religious worldviews, those theologies. So there, it turns out that what looks like tiny touch points between science and religion, there are actually lots of them. They're really intertwined. And partly, I think, the reason why people don't notice that intertwining is that they have, either they fail to recognize that uh, the sciences are actually done by humans, which would be a strange <laughs> thing to not notice. They fail to notice that people have values, not just sort of, they're not robots, which that would be a strange thing to not notice too. Um, but I think more it's the case they failed to notice because those seem implausible. They failed to notice that this thing that you're trying to put into a nice tight little box to keep it away from science called religion is not the kind of thing you put it in a tight little box. Um, you could, if all you mean by religion is uh, people's sort of ritualized behaviors, you know, oh, it's going to church. That's what I mean by religion. And mm -hmm. since you don't go to church in a science laboratory, they're completely separate. Yeah. Well, most of us don't really think that's what a religion is. We think it's a value system. It's a worldview. It's, it's a certain uh, metaphysical assumptions about how the world works. What's in it? What's the furniture of the world? Uh, what's the worth of certain things? How do we prioritize certain types of activities over others? Our moral commitments. Um, how relationships play into all of this stuff. The religion is so broad. There's no way this little, actually much smaller thing called the sciences don't touch points in what's religion. So I think the people who are really drawn to the religions in its box and sciences in the box have tiny views of both and don't mm. recognize that they intermingle. Um, so yes, the independent view, it, it seems to me, it's just a non-starter, even if at first it looks attractive. So then we have the dialogue stance. Um, and apparently this is John's stance. He describes You're on first as, name basis with John Polking. Yeah, That's because impressive. his last name is too difficult for the Latino girl. So <laughs> we're going to call him John. Um, John he P. Says, <laughs> John P. That's great. John P. Um, so this uh, dice, dialogue is the stance that recognizes that there has to be consonance between the perspectives on reality offered by science and theology if both are indeed truth-seeking endeavors. And therefore, that must be a mutually respectful interaction between the insights of the two. Um, I'm going to talk about the next stance too, because they're sort of related that the next one yeah. is integration. And that's what we want to talk about today. And he describes integrations as a stance that seeks to carry the interaction further with the ambitious aim of attaining a fully unified synthesis of science and theology merged into a single discipline. So that's how he describes the difference between dialogue Uh, which is the stance he takes, and integration. Do you think this is a fair uh, description of what you mean by integra integration or it's something different? Um, I think he's placing a different emphasis uh, than I would in the term integration. So he is defining it a little differently than I would. Okay, uh, tell us how. Yeah, so... Um, and so uh, I should just say, you know, the dialogue and the integration positions, they are the two that are most attractive to me. It seems to me the other two mm -hmm. are just wrongheaded. These two intelligent people can sort of come down on one <laughs> or the other. Um, and I'm not going to say too much nasty about sort of missing some important points. Um, <laughs> they're both, they're both sound positions to a certain extent. Uh, what I If and I, if you've defined integration, meaning that there's this complete merger of, say, theology is the term I would use, not religion. That strikes mm -hmm. me as the wrong term here. But theology or theological ways of knowing, theological inquiry and scientific inquiry, then... I get why he would be uncomfortable with that because mm. what it seems to suggest is well, you can't even do science if, you, if you're not doing theology at the same time. Okay. Um, and 
it sure looks like there are lots of people who make real contributions to discoveries and our knowledge who, well, they don't believe God exists. And so they're not approaching their work theologically, at least in any kind of explicit way. And so it sure looks like you can do scientific work and make real discoveries without having any kinds of theological commitments. And so it seems like insisting upon what his version of integration is kind of pushing too far. It feels like it's it's forcing people to be something they're not, or it's putting, you know, yeah, the criteria in the wrong place. So I get why once he's defined integration that way, he's going to say, I like dialogue instead. Hmm. Um, and there are plenty of my colleagues who I respect very much, both as uh, Christ followers and as scientists who really would identify more with that dialogue camp. They all, Sometimes they talk about it as taking two different perspectives on the same thing. So that's sometimes called perspectivalism is another term that's used. And a metaphor that is sometimes used has something to do with, it could go this way. Um, if I want to understand what's going on inside of a house, what's, what's it like inside of a house? I could look through the front door and I could mm -hmm. look through the back door, but I can't look through the front door and the back door at the same time. Yeah. But what I can do is look through the front door and then I can run around and look through the back door and then I can use both of those pieces of information to try to get a richer understanding of what's going on inside the house and what it looks like. That's kind of that dialogue or perspectival kind of thing. Um, why am I not super enthusiastic about this? Because it sounds sensible. Well, I'm not super enthusiastic about it uh, be for a couple of reasons that might seem minor, and maybe they are sometimes in some situations, they're minor concerns. One of those is this idea that the metaphor of dialogue suggests that you've got these two independent and comparable ways of knowing. Hmm. Like, like you've got two people having a dialogue and a true dialogue, as opposed to i I'm telling you what to think, suggests equality between the people who are in dialogue. You and I can have a dialogue together because we have mutual respect for each other and we each bring something valuable to the table. Nobody is commanding or sort of driving the thing all by themselves, right? There's this give and take. That's what it means to have a good dialogue. So then we can stop and say, well, is this thing science and this thing <laughs> religion of the kind of thing where they are comparable in the right way, such that dialogue is even the right metaphor for what's going on there. And mm -hmm. from the comments I've already made uh, today, as we're talking, you should be able to see that I don't think so. I don't think they're comparable in the right ways. And I could add to that story. One easy way to see how they're not comparable is theological ways of inquiry have been with us as long as there've been humans. Mm. Scientific ways of inquiry is a brand new baby. It's only 500 years old. Hasn't been around very long, which means people got along just fine without it. Thank you very much. And Ooh. still today, so much of how we know and explore the world around us doesn't require the sciences to get this there. So they're clearly not as important of ways of making sense of our life either which is a shocking thing to say in our sort of science and tech yeah. world. But the truth of the matter is if modern science died, we'd still be here. And we'd still be humans doing human, human -y things. Mm -hmm. It's not remotely as clear that if our religious and theological ways of thinking died, we would still be humans in the same way. <gasps> Bold claim. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, what? Um, it's just much more deeply rooted in our human nature, as many of those of us who work on the cognitive science of religion have argued. Whether we're religious or not, we recognize that there's something much more fundamental or connected to our deepest sort of psychology about religious expression than there is scientific expression. For a book that's really great on this, uh, Robert Macaulay's um, uh, How Religion is Natural and Science is Not, is a really great book that sort of lays this out. And he's not a religious person who's writing this. He's just, he is a philosopher of science and a cognitive scientist who has studied religion. Um, so it's really great on that. So there is an inequality, 
an asymmetry between religious and theological ways of knowing and scientific ones in terms I, I of just age before, and gap. But yeah, before we move forward, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about how um, theology is more integral and important for our humanity than science, because I can already hear people telling us, oh, if it weren't for science, you wouldn't even be here. Uh, the internet, the computers, the uh, antibiotics, you would be dead. So I think there is this pervasive narrative that science has made us who we are as humans. Um, meanwhile, real, religion or theology was something that kept us in the dark ages or whatever. So tell us more about that. Oh, well, I'm sorry. That would, that would fall back into the silly thinking kind of stuff and just sort of, <laughs> I'm afraid because, uh, you know, like I said, the sciences, modern science has not been around that long. You know, I'm sort of generously saying about 500 years, but notice that even that number is where it happened in a very narrow band of human experience. It took several hundred years after that before it even starts becoming mainstream. And this idea of the sciences as different than theological and philosophical ways of knowing, that doesn't really start crystallizing until the uh, 19th century. And again, only in a certain part of the world, namely Europe. Everybody else, there's just no, there's no distinction between these. Uh, your understanding of the natural world sort of flows from and flows into, it's uh, my language, fully integrated with your values, your, uh, your morality, your deeper commitments about the nature of the world that, you know, Aristotle called metaphysics. Um, you know, what's there? What counts as uh, the relevant categories of things? It's called ontology. All of the, those are philosophical, and if once you insert the gods into it, they're theological sorts of discussions. So it's just it's just not true that without the sciences we wouldn't be here. Without us being here, there wouldn't be sciences. I mm. mean, that's that's what's obviously true. It's an invention by a certain type of people in a certain part of the world at a certain point in history, and it could have been otherwise. So uh, let's not, the sciences are great. They're great at developing new ways, new insights and so forth. But what they don't do is fundamentally change who we are as human beings. They don't change that sort of our, our main drives have to do with trying to have relationships with each other, to love each other well, to invest in our kids and our parents and our siblings, to build communities, to try to make meaning out of our existence. Well, our religions and theologies help us work out how to do that stuff well and successfully. Um, it's not sciences that do that. And in fact, if anything, science-based technologies are getting in the way of those activities. Mm. So you might say, yeah. yeah, you and I can't have this kind of conversation without science-based technologies because we are thousands of miles away from each other at this moment. True. But they're also pushing us apart, right? Because we're starting to develop all of these fictitious relationships with each other through digital and social media, which you've written a lot, you know more about than I do. You've written books on this and done all this stuff. You're the expert on this. Um, so I think for those reasons, let's, let's not put a, an additional burden on the sciences as our saviors, as our source mm -hmm. for all values and for purpose and meaning in life. That's just putting too big a burden on the sciences to do something it was never designed to do. It was designed to give us insights about the mechanisms of things like, well, why, do, why does this plant grow better here than that plant? Mm -hmm. um, why can I eat this stuff and not this stuff when I've eaten this stuff? Um, why is it that I sleep more in the winter than in the summer? Why is it that, you know, there are these shiny things up there in the sky and, you know, that have different kinds of properties and some of them move and some of them seem like they're staying in the same place. It's that kind of stuff the sciences are good at, um, not giving us sort of meaning and purpose in life. And so that's part of, part of the story, but 
there's another part of the story in which the sort of religion thing and the science thing are asymmetrical. It's not just uh, age. It's not just pervasiveness, but um, it's also pervasiveness in terms of, you know, where people do it, but it's also sort of the depth of the kinds of issues that are uh, being grappled with. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I could say the breadth as well. The science is part of their success is being, uh, being reductive. That's sometimes used as a negative term. I don't mean it in a negative way at all. Part of the genius of scientific methods is to take big complex problems and break it down into smaller little bits that we can study much more carefully and systematically to get a handle on what's going on with those little bits. It's a little bit like if your car doesn't work, you better know something about how the little parts of the car work. Just making big pro pronouncements about the car as a whole does not work, <laughs> won't fix the car. I need to know specifically which parts of the car are not working and why. And the sciences kind of do that well. They take the big car of our lives, <laughs> use the metaphor <laughs> and break it down into little bits that then we can pay more attention to and learn better about how do they function and then how do they oh sorry how do they go together with other bits um so they are reductive and they're reductive in terms of methodology they're reductive in terms of time scale they're reductive in terms of level of analysis are we talking about or uh, you know animal systems are we talking about individuals are we talking about subsystems within an individual are we talking about subsystems within those subsystems? You know, <laughs> you can go from like sociology down to psychology to, I don't know, neuroscience, if you like, to cell biology, to biochemistry, down to, I don't know, biophysics, and then down to physics, if you like. There are all of these layers of analysis that the sciences deliberately try to narrow things down in a reductive kind of way. That's not what theology does. It's just the opposite. It's non-reductive. It's trying to say, all right, given all of that stuff, how do I put it all together to tell a comprehensive mm -hmm. story about life? That's not what the sciences do. That's what theology and philosophy do. So to pretend that those things that are synthesizing are in dialogue with something that's reducing and reductive in its very nature is also leads a very strange kind of I don't know, disanalogy with a true dialogue. So these are some of the reasons that the, the dialogue kind of thing, well, again, it sort of feels okay on a certain level. If you start looking at it carefully, it's like it's it's hiding some, some mismatches, some asymmetries that we really ought to pay attention to. These are not comparable types of things. It's, I think a lot of people, when they do this, they think, oh, well, the scientific sciences are a way of knowing. Religion is a way of knowing. But again, that's not those of us who actually study religions. It's not just a way of knowing. This is a way of being. It's of living, of values, of, and it is a way of knowing, but it's a completely different kind of way of knowing. It's a non reductive way of knowing. It's an encapsulating, in, all encompassing way of knowing. And then all of these other things, and of feeling, and of relating, and of interpreting, and of on and on and on. Whereas the sciences are, yes, a way of knowing, full stop. So there's this great asymmetry. So it's weird to talk about them in dialogue. Um, before okay, I say okay. something else, I I know you are probably itching to throw something in there. <laughs> no, right? no. I, I wonder now what does your version of integration looks like? Yeah, that's a fair, fair question. So mm -hmm. um, my view on integration then, because I'm not looking for this sort of complete merger necessarily. What I am looking for is a recognition of when it is that my particular worldview does motivate, inform, and inflect the work of the sciences. So that's part of it. That's a big part of it. And so even if you want to say, well, look, uh, non-religious people can make contributions in the sciences. Of course they can. Of course they can. But what is it about their values, their commitments that enable them to do that in an intellectually coherent kind of way? Mm -hmm. I think it's important for them as integrated individuals to be thoughtful about that. Because it could turn out for any of us that we've got some assumptions 
that we're using to guide our sciences that uh, maybe don't fit with our other values, maybe don't fit with our other kinds of commitments. Um, and so there can be some mismatches and then we're not fully integrated whole people. And so when I talk about integration, I like to really emphasize, well, a couple of sorts of integration. I mentioned that this activity that John Polkinghorne was doing is a sort of theoretical integration. I'm really in some ways much more integrated in, uh, sorry, interested in professional and personal integration. So how do scientists recognize how their values, their worldview helps motivate and uh, color the way they do their scientific activity? Once we get a handle on that, we start seeing, oh, these sort of broad theoretical types of stuff, they sort of sound pretty good on paper, but they don't necessarily do a lot of work for us in the day-to-day -day doing of science, a scientific kind of inquiry stuff. Um, so there's that side. But then on the other side, those of us who are religious or theologically inclined type of people, why in the world wouldn't we bring in insights from the sciences to help inform our whole lives including our lived religious experiences and our theological inquiry or our sort of reflections, what's that theological inquiry? Reflections on uh, God's existence, his properties, our relationship to him, and how all of the world makes sense or doesn't in light of God. Mm -hmm. um, all of that stuff, that theological stuff, well, why wouldn't the sciences bring be brought to bear on that? Why wouldn't we integrate the sciences into that theological inquiry? Um, dialogue isn't quite right. Yeah. Right? Uh, I, uh, one of my sort of touchstone kind of passages of the Bible uh, in this regard actually comes from 1 Kings, where Solomon has... Uh, been chosen by God to lead the, the the people of Israel after David, his father David. And Solomon is sort of faced with, you know, God makes an offer. He says, hey, dude, I'm picking you. Yeah, you've got brothers, including the guy with the big hair. Was that Absalom? Isn't that the guy who gets his hair caught in the trees? Bad dude. You know, he's trying to kill his dad. Bad dude. I don't trust guys with too much hair, you know. Um, but uh, Solomon... Right says, God, I need wisdom. If I'm going to lead your people, I need wisdom. And God says, that's exactly the right thing to ask for. I'm going to give it to you. And shortly thereafter, yes, we are presented with these fun little stories that we all learn in you know Sunday school about Solomon, you know, threatening to cut babies in half and all of that. <laughs> but what we often forget is people from all over that local part of the world are said to have come to Solomon to not just hear about you know, his judicious decisions, but about his insights about plants and animals and things like that, because he had all of this knowledge of the natural world. Why? That was part of the wisdom. Wisdom, in at least a biblical understanding, is, is knowledge put into action. But we hear over and over again, it's also knowledge in relationship to God. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Our constant refrains throughout the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Um, it is then strange to think of theology as not having something to do with the natural world at all, or especially the human aspects of the natural world that, oh, that's the domain of the sciences. Since when? Why did we cut that off from the rest of just knowing? Theologically, we shouldn't do that. That's not a biblical view of wisdom and knowledge. They're supposed to be integrated. But for some reason, as we, in our cosmopolitan kinds of societies, especially in North Atlantic types of countries, um, as the universities developed and we had these political systems that were trying to keep different religions from playing nice to each with each other and also playing nice with non-religious people, we decided we needed to somehow partition off certain uh, ways of knowing from that theology and religious stuff. And I get that as a technique for helping people get along, but what we should never have done is said, and that's the way it must be and should always be. Like, well, no, 
theological knowing needs to be informed by how the best sciences of the day, like Solomon, used the best natural understanding of his day to inform his leadership, theological leadership, as well as political leadership of people, you know, God's people. Likewise, we should be using our best knowledge of the natural world, which comes from the sciences, including our knowledge of the human world, which comes from the human sciences, to inform our good theologically informed decision making, right? So our theology shouldn't be divorced from the sciences. It should be integrated. So that's why I like to use this term integrated um, some people go farther and they'll talk about fusion or something mm. like that. Now, nah, integrated is good enough to me because what's the opposite of integration? It's disintegration. And who wants to be disintegrated? That just sounds awful. I mean, that's <laughs> like some, you know, yeah, uh, just, you know, uh, Avengers kind of end game deal there <laughs> and stuff. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so, how would this? view of science and theology change the way the disciplines are approached right now? Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. So they're not disciplines. <gasps> bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. So that's that's part of that dialogue idea is we say, oh, these are different disciplines. They're not. Um, they're not the same type of thing. Again, it's it's like comparing, you know, I don't know, what they say in Britain is chalk and cheese, right? They're not the same kind of thing. We say, you know, apples and oranges, but in the yeah. US, but it's weird because apples and oranges are both fruit. I'm suggesting that whatever this thing religion is in these discussions, it's much bigger and broader and very mm. different than this thing called science, but you'll find, I don't even like the term science very much because it, yeah. really there are all these different sciences and each of them are slightly different than each other and they're constantly changing and we're getting new sciences. So I even kind of, yeah, they're not disciplines. Psychology is a discipline. Science isn't a discipline. I don't know what it is. It's uh, a general stance toward exploring the natural world. It's a set of tools at best with a rough boundary. Theology is a mode of reflection on everything God and God's relation to everything. Um, well, that's not a discipline. Uh, and especially once we start talking about lived theology, then it's, this is a worldview. This is a stance toward life. Um, so it's a value, it's whatever it is, which is why it's hard to talk about these things as it's at all. Um, but I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this makes a lot of sense. Like in a personal, I'm a scientist or I'm a theologian and I can bring um, this insights into my work. But what about like in the academy uh, when you're yeah, publishing okay. scientific papers or theological papers? Yeah, good. No, that's it's a great question. Um, yeah. the So what and who cares? How does this view matter? Um, I think what our discussion already has revealed is any kind of simplistic, uh, it's got to be one of these four types of interaction between this thing and this thing. It's just, it's overly simplifying the space. Yeah. And that doesn't reflect our lived realities in any way, let alone how you might structure things in a university. So what does it suggest for university structures? I think it does suggest that um, while it is the case that people of different worldviews can make contributions to various domains of knowing without committing themselves to the assumptions of these other worldviews, there's a place and there will always be a valuable place for doing that synthesizing kind of activity where now we want to bring all of these different pieces together and to try to more comprehensively answer questions about the nature of the world, about human life and purpose and human flourishing, such that we can really answer the big questions that can't be reduced to a simple one level kind of one discipline scientific problem or a historical problem or an economic problem or whatever the discipline disciplinary space is. We need that, that ability to synthesize stuff. And sadly, most contemporary modern universities don't do that. They've chopped things up so much and our publishing outlets don't do it very well so that there's not that space for bringing it all together and integrating things. 
And on even worse still, not only are there not for, a, for that integration, we're not trained to do it well. And yet we as scholars are not trained to do it well. Our, our PhDs are usually very narrow, uh, deliberately so, so that we get, you know, strong sort of uh, street cred in that space. And I'm not critiquing that, but at a certain point, we need to learn how to connect that to everything else. We need opportunities to learn how to do that well. We need to exercise those muscles. And what, in lacking that, what we often see today and here's the problem, is we often see that people who are not well positioned to do that kind of integrated work are called upon by, say, journalists or mm. policymakers to do just that, the thing they were never trained to do well and that they've deliberately not exercised doing. And so you get scientists, for instance, making proclamations about uh, the values and morality that you can get from the sciences. And they are so naive about this. And I don't mean that in a mean way. They just are in a descriptive way because <laughs> they were never trained at that. They, they don't have the education to do that. And then their sort of blind spots have never been properly exposed, but they have the prestige of, I'm a scientist, so I can talk mm -hmm. about whatever I want. And like, actually, scientists are probably some of the least broad people that we should be talking to about some of these things, at least by virtue of being a scientist. Smart people, sure, maybe they're thoughtful people and maybe they've educated themselves on other things. That's great. But by virtue of just being a scientist, doesn't let you make any kind of interesting pronouncement on, uh, I don't know, big policy decisions, how we should educate our kids, what we should educate them about, um, what it means to live a good life, uh, how we should distribute, uh, I don't know, resources in terms of medicine or food or you know, different kinds of freedoms. I mean, that's not what scientists are for. Now they've, they've drifted out of their lane, right? But we need those spaces where we have the input of scientists on these broader kinds of considerations so that that can be integrated in a more comprehensive way of, of addressing these big problems. Um, in terms of disciplines, I guess, I mean, one of the things this kind of analysis suggests to me is in universities, there should always be a place for philosophy and theology to do mm -hmm. some of that integrative synthesizing work. Um, theologians, one of the things they can do better is learn better how to incorporate the input of the sciences. Um, and while I don't want to give them more to do because their job is hard already, it's already multidisciplinary. They have to learn about linguistics and history and sometimes archaeology and textual studies as sometimes philosophy as well as theological content and try to work all of that together. That's a lot. So saying, hey, and you need to learn about, I don't know, sociology and psychology and neuroscience and uh, I don't know, anthropology and evolutionary studies, that's asking a lot. So maybe instead theologians should be trained up to just identify when is it I need these other specialists to give me the input that I need and how do I evaluate that input for quality and quality assurance and so forth. Um, I sometimes use the uh, analogy of theologians as like a conductor of an orchestra as opposed to just being a soloist musician. Mm that they know what kind okay i've got the i've got the score i need to interpret the score but to make the score come to life i need musicians who play all of these different kinds of instruments and i need to know how to get how to coordinate them how to bring their expertise out to create this symphony um, this much bigger kind of sound in little projects on the side, maybe, okay, I'll just take out my violin and play all by myself. But mm -hmm. for really big, interesting problems, I need to integrate all of the contributions of these very specialists. I need to be more like the conductor of an orchestra. That's kind of a role that a theologian ought to play, it seems to me, and that our current academic structures make it almost impossible for them to play. And that's a shame. I think the world is a much poorer place because of it. In part because yeah. they have this funny idea that no science or religion keep them in their boxes, or at best let them dialogue with each other. It's like nah, let's get integrated. It seems like there's a lot of work to do to get there integrated. So much work. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's end up with one little thing. 
one thing a scientist or a theologian can do, or a, like a person who is interested in the insights of theology and science, um, what can they do to be a little more integrated today? Uh, one thing you could do to be more integrated, if you're a science-y type of person, um, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give you five little questions that you can ask yourself and we can discuss these in more depth awesome. than on another, another occasion, but uh, five questions to ask yourself periodically as you do your scientific work. Question one, does my worldview give me an adequate foundation for doing scientific work? Does it motivate is another way to put that. Does it, does it motivate me in the right way? Does it say, this is what I ought to be doing? And does it give me enough of the intellectual tools for saying, and doing the sciences is a good, valuable contribution I can be making to the world? That's question one. So does my worldview help motivate uh, or inform and give me an adequate foundation? Number two. How does my worldview, my theology, my religion, my philosophy, how does it motivate the particular questions I'm asking? Have you ever thought about that? Uh, number three, how does it mo how does my worldview or my religion, my theology, how does it um, impact the way I think about the methods that I use? my use of statistics, my use of mathematic modeling, my treatment of human subjects or animal subjects in my work. How does it matter to my methods? One, two, three, four. <laughs> How does my worldview interpret, impact my interpretation of my findings? My so what and who cares? And who am I going to communicate this to? Why is this worth not just my investment, but the public's investment? Why should they pay attention to me? Why should I be supported through universities and you know government funding and everything else? What's what's the, the take home message that matters to the world? And how does my worldview then help shape that? And finally, how does my worldview, my religion, my theology impact the way I treat other scientists? We often think of the sciences as a solo activity. It's not, it's a social activity, it's distributed. We work in teams. We share ideas with other labs. We critique each other. We're opponents and sort of competitors sometimes. But how does my worldview, how do my values influence how I treat each other, or treat my colleagues in the scientific space? So those five questions, I think, are really great start for moving down the pathway of becoming an integrated science-y type person. So I, I offer those. Those are awesome. And I think they can be scary if someone hasn't ever thought about these things and someone maybe thinks they don't have a worldview or a theology or a philosophy, you all do, but most of us haven't thought of that really deeply. So that can be scary, but yeah. I think it's it is a little helpful bit. and necessary. Yeah. Well, thank you, Justin. And thank you all well, for you. joining us in this Integrated Life. We hope this was helpful to you and inspiring, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.